Well, good morning and welcome to pharmacology. Uh, we've reviewed some of pharmacology, remember, in a class called pharmacology. So this is really going to be a review at this particular point in time. So when we start to talk about pharmacology, what we're looking at are things like number of categories. Remember, we have different families. They do different things. Remember your sympatholytics, or your bronchodilators, your parasympatholytics. Those are the families we recommend for patients of COPD. Um, then there's the inhaled corticosteroids. And we're seeing more and more of those being used because they actually do have some benefit, a lot of benefit for to us in some cases. Some of the medications, especially the lavas and the inhaled corticosteroids, support each other. And part of the things that they do is they cut down on the tolerance that would build up to the beta agonist. Uh, it also cuts down on a, um, the problem with the inhaled corticosteroids, so it actually makes the receptor sites more responsive to what the steroids need to do. They all have different onsets, durations, and then they have an action. What do they do at this particular point in time? Do they cause bronchodilation? Do they break down bonds in the mucus? What is it that they're doing at this point? Unfortunately, most of the drugs that you take do have side effects. It was interesting when Spiriva came out. We're going to talk about Spiriva. We talk about the parasympathetics. Uh, one of the things that they had said was that there were no side effects to it. And now we know that, in fact, there are side effects to it. So with the sympathomimetic, some of the other names that we look at, these are your beta agonists, beta, ag beta adrenergic, your bronchodilators, they're all derivatives of epi. Epi is the big daddy rabbit from these guys. Uh, they all stimulate adenocyclase and CAMP. That's what allows the airways to relax. We use these with all our obstructive diseases. Uh, in the case of COPD, we're now doing labas, lamas, and inhaled corticosteroids, a three-in-one because this helps our patients. We had three different categories. The first one is your ultra-short acting. These are the catecholamines. These are the ones that have very fast onset but a very short duration. You have short acting ones. These are your rescue inhalers. These are the ones we give you. I don't care if you have asthma, COPD, whatever it is, if you're having a problem, these are the ones that you're going to take that are going to help you breathe. And then the long-acting ones, these are your maintenance drugs. These are the ones that will hold you overnight so that you don't wake up and have to take breathing treatments at that particular point in time. It also um, works well with us. And this is one of the new ways of administering MDIs. You can actually put the MDI in your mouth. So all of these stimulate adenocyclase, they increase your cyclic CAMP, and it is the most widely prescribed class of bronchodilators at this point. We have more drugs in this family than we have in other families that we're using. So we have our two major categories. We have our rescue agents. These are the ones where you have airway obstruction. Patient is unable to breathe. It could be acute asthma exacerbation. It could be an exacerbation of their COPD, whatever's going on with them. We also have the controller agents. These are your long-term maintenance ones. You do have some 12-hour. You do have some 24-hour maintenance drugs now. This helps you sleep through the night. This is one of the problems we used to have, especially with children and um, asthma and things like that is they didn't sleep through the night. Parents were constantly waking up, so we had lost school days, we lost, had lost work days, different problems along that line. So these have really helped us. You can see they're wonder drugs. So the, where do the catecholamines work? There's three re receptor sites that we talk about. One is the alpha receptor. Alpha receptor works in the upper airway. This is the causes basal constriction. So if you have any type of strider, um, upper airway edema, one of the things we want to give you is going to be a medication that increases the basal constriction so that now you can breathe and not have an issue with it. They also increase your blood pressure a little bit, so that's one of the things we have to watch when we're talking about our patients. Beta-1 
uh, these are your heart rate and your contractility, your conotropic, your inotropic. Chronotropic talks about timing. How fast is the heart rate going? How slow is the heart rate going at this point? So in some cases, if you have a heart rate that's extremely low in the 20s, 30s, 40s, sometimes we'll give you uh, atropine uh, to go ahead and raise your heart rate. Inotropic has to do with contractility. How hard is the heart pumping. If you have CHF, a lot of times your heart is not working appropriately. We can give you cardiac drugs that will make the heart beat much better. And as a result of that, we can now start to move the uh, fluid out of the airways. So these are the beta-2. These are the major drugs that we use. Uh, they work in the airways themselves. Uh, they do cause smooth muscle relaxation, stimulate mucociliary activity, inhibit some of the inflammatory mediator release. This is why they work well with the inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, one of the things that we see sometimes is we'll have folks call us. They'll say, can you come and give this patient a breathing treatment? We'll ask them, you know, what's going on with this patient. They're going to tell you they have some upper airway strider. Um, so we want you to give them an albuterol treatment. Well, albuterol works in the airways. It doesn't work in the upper airways. And so the medication they should be asking for is racemic epi. So there's your lungs. That's just, again, to tell you that's where our beta-2 beta works. And it makes them feel much better. It opens them up for us. So the ultra-short-acting catecholamines, they all lack specific beta-2 activity. They all have a little bit of something else with them. It could be the alpha. It could also be the beta-1. They do cause tachycardia. They do increase blood pressure. They all have a fast onset. They all have a very short duration. And the first one, and who's the granddaddy of this family, is Epi. All these, are, all these drugs are built off of the Epi chain. So there you see racemic Epi. Other names for it are micronephrine, vaponephrine. It affects both the alpha and the beta sites. So when we're giving these to our patients, we expect to see a little bit increase in the blood pressure. We will also see an increase in the heart rate. It's given by SVM, 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 mLs. Onset is going to be three to five minutes. It's fairly rapid, but it only lasts from a half an hour to two to three hours at this particular point. So what does it do for us? Remember, alpha is vasoconstriction. So if we have strider, we have croup, something like that, they may go ahead and ask us, can you go ahead and give them a treatment with epinephrine? Something else to think about, and we just got through talking about aerosols, you can also use a cool aerosol in combination with this. The cool aerosol will also cause some vasoconstriction. So when we're talking with the folks who want or need us at that point, we need to ask them, you know, is this patient getting oxygen? If they are, let's go ahead and set up a cool mist for them. Even if they're not getting oxygen, if it's bad enough, let's just go ahead and set up cool mist on, on room air. Remember, beta-2 is your bronchodilation at that point. Epi also acts, acts on the heart. Uh, one of the problems with epi sometimes is it uses a lot of oxygen, and so we need to make sure that that patient's on supplemental oxygen. Okay, so something else that's really, really good to help us with our upper airway edema is your cool mist, okay? Another one, we don't see too much of this anymore, is isoproterenol. Isoproterenol used to be part of the ACLS uh, algorithm. That's your advanced cardiac life support. Uh, we've sort of pushed it off the algorithm. Doesn't mean that it's out of all of the med boxes or anything like that, but it's not on the algorithm anymore. The brand name was Isopril. It is a beta receptor site, so it doesn't work at all on the upper airway. SVN 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 mLs or 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams. The MDI, MDI is like 103 micrograms per puff. On set on this one, two to five minutes. Duration anywhere from a half an hour to two hours. And like I said, we hardly ever use this today. The last place we had it was on the ACLS algorithm uh, with our Pulses VTAC 
oh, AFib algorithm. But the uh, American Heart Association has pretty well cut it off at this point. Isoetherine is in the same boat. We don't have that much anymore. So its brand name is the same as its generic name, isoetherine. It also is a beta receptor site. Comes with the same doses of the 0.25 to 0.5 mLs or the 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams. Now remember, when we're giving these, we're also diluting them with normal saline. A lot of the times we have our unit doses, which already has the saline involved with it. Other times it just comes as the drug and we have to ask, add the saline to it. Onset, about one to six minutes. Duration, anywhere from 15 minutes to 60 minutes. The problem with isoetherine and isoproteranol is we can give it to you. It may or may not hold you, but if we're giving it fairly close, say every two hours or so, we're going to have an issue with your heart rate. So we really need to be careful when we were given these drugs as a result of the increased heart rate. And it, like again, it's rarely used today. So the short-acting non-catecholamines, they still have epi in their chain. It's just that we've modified that chain a bit. Chain a bit. So now they're non-catecholamines. They have a longer-acting beta-2 specific drugs. They still have some beta-1 in there. We see that because one of the side effects is tachycardia. Uh, and so we are aware of that, okay? It has onsets that's different for different drugs. The major drugs, though, in this category that we use, albuterol, leave albuterol, their onset's about 15 minutes. What's interesting with these two drugs is if you're giving an uh, SVN with them, we will see those drugs onset much, much quicker than those 15 minutes. And the question comes up, well, how do you know that it takes less than 15 minutes for these to start to react, is we're monitoring these patients. We're able to listen to them. We're able to look at their vital signs. Uh, we're able to see what's happening with them, even their subjective reaction. You can see them starting to settle down, starting to relax. The shoulders are dropping. They're not using as much accessory muscle as they were before. So we know that with the SVNs, we get a little bit quicker reaction. Duration for these, anywhere from four to six hours. Uh, it, how does, long does it take for six hours? It just depends. Most of the time when we're giving these treatments in the hospital, they're a Q4 treatment, and so we just don't do much with that six hours. However, if the patient were to tell us, hey, can you come back in two hours and do this? I think I'm going to be good. As long as the patient is good after we've done our assessment, we can come back in two hours and do your treatment. Problem with these, you lose overnight bronchodilation. And as we talked a little bit about in the beginning, once you start losing overnight bronchodilation, you're looking at sleeplessness. We see the kids are up, they're coughing, they're wheezing, whatever else is going on. Parent or parents have to get up to help take care of them. There's your lost work day, there's your lost school. So one we don't see much on the market, but still is there is Al Alupan or metoproteranol. If you notice, the doses have changed. The SVN for metoproteranol is either 0.2 or 0.3 mLs, or it's a 4 to 6% solution. And so when you're ordering these or your physician's ordering these drugs, they have to tell you how many mLs do they want and or what percentage you want at this particular point. We've had physicians who are so used to ordering albuterol, they order an SVN of 0.5 mLs. We'll go up to them and ask them, you know, 0.25 is not what this medication comes in. What is it that you'd like them to receive? And they'll go, I don't know what you're talking about. And then you need to explain to them, this comes as an SVN of 0.2 or 0.3 mLs. Pharmacy will do this sometimes if they get there before we do. We just need to be aware that we have to watch that. MDI, 650 micrograms per puff. Onset, really fast onset. If you notice, it's one to five minutes. And patients who use Alupent will tell you they can actually feel that relief coming on fairly quickly after they do it. Duration, anywhere from two to six hours. A lot of times your duration depends on how bad are you. 
If you're really, really bad off, uh, we see the duration shortening on you. If you're doing fairly well, then we're gonna see the duration stand out. Tributylene is another one we use. Tributylene has more than indications than just uh, beta-2. It comes in different names, brethene, brethair, bricanel, all the three Bs. The SVN in this case is three mLs. Most of the time when we have to bring drawer up tributylene, it comes in little bottles of one mL per m, uh, milligram, and you have to do three bottles of it. You can see this is one of the ways it comes, and you can see this is a glass vial. And you're going to see at the bottom here, I'm going to tell you that sometimes you have to use a filtered needle. The reason being is this is a glass vial, and when you break it off, some of that glass can go into the drug, and you may not even see it. And so when you draw it up with a filtered needle, it filters those glass particles out. Sometimes your physician will order a sub-Q injection of this in between the breathing treatments. Uh, they will sit there and go, I don't want this patient getting breathing treatments every two hours. It's too much on the cardiovascular system, too much of a workload at this particular point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to order 0.25 milligrams sub-Q. Sub-Q right now is the nursing order. So if we're getting a call that says you need to come up and give Mr. Jones another breathing treatment, he's having a hard problem with his breathing, then we need to talk to the nurse and ask them, has he had his sub-Q injection of tributylene? Sometimes they'll say, well, no, I was waiting for, and then we'll ask him, can you go ahead and do that for us at this point? And then we'll monitor him, make sure he's getting better. Onset for this, five minutes to 30 minutes, it comes in tablets. Anything that's a tablet has to have systemic circulation, has to be broken down in the gastric system. As a result of that, much, much longer for this stuff to be uh, transported around the body and therefore has a longer onset. Duration, anywhere between three and six hours. It does come in brown bottles or packaging because what can happen is the light will inactivate it. So it has to be kept covered. And in some cases, there's your filter needle at this point. Now, if you go and you pick up some tributylene, you're gonna see the same thing with racemic epi. I should have mentioned back then. Um, sometimes you may see with albuterol, if it's not clear liquid, there's a problem with it. It's probably been inactivated at that point. Uh, sometimes it turns brown. Uh, what do we do when that happens? Is we go ahead and we gather up the supplies that we have and we take it back to pharmacy. Pharmacy will then go ahead and exchange it with us. And then what they do is they send it back to the people People that they got it from. You want to make sure that you follow this procedure because if you don't, you're paying for drugs that you're not using, and that's quite a bit of money out of the department's pocket. And there's albuterol. We still have multi-dose bottles. At one time, the FDA was trying to do away with the multi-dose bottles. Part of the reason was is that people you know, would put them in rooms of isolation rooms, and they would take them out of isolation rooms. Uh, folks weren't watching how much drug they were giving to the patients. Had a lot of issues with it. If you ever see a multi-dose bo bottle, you'll always need to make sure that it has someone's initials on it, the date, and the time it was open. And after a certain number of days, you have to get rid of it. You cannot continue to use it. The two brand names that we use for the most part are Proventol and Ventolin. A lot of patients don't understand that these are the same drugs as albuterol. And so when you're talking to your patient, especially a new patient, and you ask them, have you ever taken albuterol? They'll tell you, no, no, I don't ever take albuterol. I take Ventolin. Okay, sounds fair enough. We can handle this. Uh, some of them will tell you, I don't take Ventolin. I have to take albuterol. And we'll say, okay, we can handle that also. This one goes back to, if you notice, the epidose, 0.5 mLs or 2.5 milligrams. On occasions with young children, with the babies, sometimes your physician will sit there and order 0.25 mLs or 1.5 milligrams. Sometimes, too, with our patients of age who have a really bad reaction to it, it causes a lot of tremor because that's the number one side effect, your physician will go ahead and order 0.3 mLs of the drug. And so what has to happen with it, we have to make sure that we dilute it down to that. 
It does have an MDI, 90 micrograms per puff. Lots of different folks put out MDIs for this. On set again, for the most part, 15 minutes. Like I said with the SVNs, we sit a little bit quicker. Duration, anywhere from four to six hours. And we actually use this quite a bit today. The Totorol, this is a home drug. And the question comes up, why do you want us to know a home drug? And the reason is, is when you're talking to your patients and you tell them, we're going to give you a breathing treatment, we're going to use out, give you albuterol. Have you ever used albuterol? Sometimes they're going to tell you, I don't like that drug. That's a really bad drug. I want my betonerol. And we're going to say, well, unfortunately, you can't have that. That is a home drug. If a patient wants to use their home medication, what has to happen is, is you have to ask the physician. You can write them a note if you see them. Uh, tell them, you know, this is what's going on with Mrs. Jones. She does not want to use the SVN. She does not want to use the M MDIs. She wants her betonerol. Uh, it's up to the physician to say, yes, they can, or no, they can't. When they tell you, yes, they can, they're going to go ahead and put a note in the chart that says, patient is allowed to use their home drugs. What goes along with this, and it doesn't seem like it would, but it fits in perfectly here, if your patient tells you, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? Go grab my bag out of the cabinet or take it out of the bottom drawer here. I'm going to pull something out of it because I need it. Sometimes they're pulling their drugs out. Please don't do that. If you touch patient's stuff, if it ever gets broken or lost, you're the last person to have touched it, and they're going to accuse you of doing it. So, you know, if somebody tells you, hey, I need my purse, you need to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Someone else needs to do that for you. This is also Tornolate. It comes as an SVN, 0.31 milligrams, and a 0.2% solution, or the same thing, 1.25 milligram, milliliters, or 2.5 milligrams. It also has an MDI. <clears throat> And if you notice the puffs on this, <clears throat> excuse me, are Q8 at this particular point. On set for this, three to four minutes. This is part of the reason why patients like this, especially for their home use, because they get that quick onset. Duration anywhere between five and eight hours. It is a pro drug. We don't have many pro drugs, but this is a drug when you take it, it mixes in the body. So it doesn't. You know, if you just say, I'm not going to give it to you, just hold on to it, do whatever else, it's not going to work. It has to be mixed in the body. Ruterol is another one. This is Max Air. We have a lot of patients who use Max Air. Uh, they swear by it. And, you know, that's fine. That's not a problem. It has an MDI, 200 micrograms per puff, and you do two puffs every two to four to six hours with this one. Onset for this one, another fast onset, five minutes. This is another reason why your patients like their Max Air. They're going to tell you, I love my Max Air. Why can't I use it? Um, and we need to tell them the physician hasn't allowed you to do that. And duration is right around five hours. Now, the question comes up, what are you going to do if you walk in and here's the patient using their inhaler and it's time for their SVN treatment? Well, because they've already taken their drug, and it could be. So if you see that, you need to make sure that you talk with this patient. And you need to tell them, you know, you cannot be mixing these drugs. I cannot give you a breathing treatment at this point because you've already taken the drug. Uh, if they tell you, oh, I've got to have it, I've got to have it, uh, go, go get your nurse, go get your physician if they're around and ask them to go ahead and explain to this patient what's going on with it. But you cannot overdose these patients at this point. Okay, so be on the lookout. You cannot take that inhaler away from them. That's their inhaler. They brought it with them. It's their property. Uh, what you can tell them to do is put it away because we don't want to see it. And there's your MDI. In used. And then the newest one we see is levalbuterol. Uh, basically, it binds, has a greater affinity at the receptor sites at lower doses than albuterol. Uh, it shows that, that 
0.63 milligrams produces an FAV1 change that's a very equivalent to the 2.5 milligram dose of albuterol. What we see with the levalbuterol, it hit the market. It's a single isomer drug, which means it only has one of the SR properties. And so it's a little bit more beta 2 than beta 1. And the cardiologists liked that because they didn't see the tach as much tachycardia and other cardiac things with this drug. However, a lot of times when we were looking at these drugs, people would say, what's well, doing the same thing as albuterol is? It's causing bronchodilation, doing what it needs to. And as a result of that, a lot of the hospitals stopped carrying this as part of their formulary. Remember, the formulary is the list of drugs that you can give a patient. It's the ones that the hospital, in fact, has, okay? So at one time when levalbuterol came around, we used to have to go to the pharmacy to pick this drug up because of the expense of it. And so that's why another reason why a lot of the hospitals have stopped using it. Zopinex is its brand name. It comes both as an SVN. If you look and see the dosages are 0 0.31, 0 0.63, 1.25 milligrams. One of the validation questions on the boards was what is the last name of Zopinex? And part of the reason they ask you that is most of the SVNs for albuterol and the other drugs are MLs. So this is a change. It also came out as an MDI. It was about a year coming out late, but we still do have it. Onset, just like albuterol, about 15 minutes. Duration, somewhere between 5 to 8 hours. One of the settling points that Sepacor used to tell folks was this. If you take and use leave a butyrol, you can cut your workforce down. And the reason you cut your workforce down is that this drug lasts between five to eight hours. So instead of having to do a treatment every four hours, now you can do one every maybe eight hours. And so you don't need as many therapists as you normally did. Well, the duration is between five and eight hours. So it could work, but only last five hours, you're just an hour off of that Q4. And so you're still going to have same same number of treatments and things to work with. And it is the newest bronchodilator. We don't have a new one at this point. And it is a single isomer beta 2 selective. Okay. So long-acting bronchodilators, these are your maintenance or controller drugs. They have a much lower onset. One of the ones that's interesting is Foradil or Formoterol. The onset of Foradil or Formoterol is actually five minutes. Well, that five minutes is not going to give you relief because it's not designed to do that. So we need to make sure that we're educating our patients on what these are. When these drugs first hit the market, we had a lot of problems with our patients. We told them this is a long-acting bronchodilator. It's going to work for 12 hours. Uh, and people are like, oh, my heavens, this is wonderful. I don't have to take as many this as many times as I'm taking the other ones. And we would end see these patients in the hospital and talk with them and you know ask them do you know about this drug i know and i don't have to see you guys anymore you know i can come in here and once a day that's all you have to do and we're sitting there going that's not quite how this works here uh, you need to make sure that you're breathing appropriately these are not rescue inhalers a lot of folks unfortunately were actually found dead in their homes with an can, empty canister of these long-acting bronchodilators because they did not understand that they had such a long onset. More beta-2 specific, which is good. There's your maintenance and nocturnal control. It also helped with students. Uh, you guys know that when you're in, a teenager in school, uh, one of the things is that you always want to fit in with the rest of the crowd. The rest of the crowd is not using their inhalers when they can't breathe because they don't have any. And so sometimes we have folks who actually get in trouble because they didn't want to leave their crowd at that point. With these drugs, they could take them before they went to school, and then they didn't have to worry until they got home and they were ready to go to bed to take their second dose. The FDA actually did a study, and one of the things they found out with these bronchodilators is that there were some asthma-related deaths and intubations. 
And one of the things they wanted to do is they wanted to try to prevent that. So what they did is they came out and they basically said, what we're going to do is we're thinking about taking all of these off the market. And it's like, oh, please don't do that. These are really, really good for maintenance. And then they said, well, then the other thing we're thinking about doing is making you mix them with the inhaled corticosteroids. And if they, because we think that's much, much better. And uh, what they did is they went ahead and they put a black box around them. Black box means that these are very dangerous drugs and they're going to cause some issues with you. Once they uh, went ahead and mixed them, then they said, well, we'll go ahead and release uh, these drugs and relieve them on the market, okay? And, um, but the thing about it is they have to be mixed with the inhaled corticosteroid. And that was pretty good because it seemed to work much better. The other thing that they said is once you have your patients maintained on these drugs, what we want you to do is take them off. And we're like, oh, wait a minute. These are long-term maintenance. They're not short-term maintenance. And so if you take them off, something that we have to watch out for are more exacerbations, more hospital uh, visits, uh, more intubations, things like that. So it was a lot of reluctance in the community to go ahead and once these folks were stable to take them off and see what happens to them. Last couple of years, probably a couple Two years ago, the FDA was looking at their clinical trials that they ran, and they found out that the number of deaths had decreased dramatically. And as a result of that, they took the black box away. So these are now safe to use again. You can see the other things these do is they can help control airway inflammation. They do help control bronchospasm. And then they each work together to make sure we're getting a better drug in the end. Okay, so some of the common long-acting beta agonists, and they use these drugs over in Europe also. It's interesting too, there was this uh, article, and I'll see if I can find it and I'll share it with you guys or tell you where to go find it, that in Europe, they're not using albuterol anymore. What they're starting to do is going to the long acting beta agonists. And I'm like, oh, interesting. So, one is Boradil or Formoterol. This one um, actually has to be refrigerated, it has its own um, holder that you can use to, to give this medication. It comes as a caplet. Cerevent, which is Salmuterol, that was the first one. This is both an MDI and a DPI. Rovana, a formoterol. This is for patients with COPD, and it is a nebulizer. It's a twice a day nebulizer. And then Performance is another uh, work of formoterol also. So the onset for this is 20 minutes or more. Duration is 12 hours. Second one is for Motorol. For Motorol came out in 2001. Uh, it's a DPI, 12 micrograms per inhalation twice a day. They did do some research on this and they found out at the lower dose is 6 micrograms. It didn't work at 12, 24 micrograms that caused bronchoconstriction. Onset for this is 5 minutes, but just remember that 5 minutes is not the dose or equivalent to doing albuterol. Well, just remember that uh, this onset does not mean it's going to be a rescue drug, okay? And duration is 12 hours and it must be refrigerated. The nice thing about this one, the nice thing about Spareva, these are caplets. And because they're caplets, you can go ahead and puncture them. You can see if all the medication came out of it. If the med patient has inhaled all the medication, you can have them do it again to make sure that they do have all that medication. Bravana, there it is, a formoterol tartrate. 15 micrograms per 2 ml of normal saline twice daily. Nebulizer only. This is the one that we use for our patients who have COPD. And there's some good advice that the physician is giving her patient. 
So combination drugs, Advair, this has been on the market for quite a while. It's Flovent plus Cerevent. Comes in three different doses. Simbacort, it's a combination of Pomacort and Fordil. There's at least two different uh, doses of that. And Dolores, combination of Mometsasone and Formoterol. I'm not quite sure how many different uh, combinations there are of that one. This is uh, Zolair. Zolair so is steroid-free injection used for moderate to severe persistent asthma year-round allergies. When they did the clinical trials on this, they were just amazed at how good it worked with patients. Problem with this one, though, when it came out, it was black boxed, and it's still black boxed as far as we know. Uh, one of the side effects that um, the researchers said, they're not quite sure how that ended up, but it caused cancer in some patients, and their take on this was that perhaps they had the cancer prior to the clinical trials, um, and that it wasn't caused by the Zolaire. So the question is, is why is it black boxed? Well, the problem with Zolaire is you can have an anaphylactic reaction anytime. It doesn't have to be taken on the day that you take it. It doesn't have to be the next day after you took it. It can happen at any time. So you always have to have an EpiPen with you. You guys remember the EpiPens went through quite a bit of... Um, <sighs> Bad reputation, shall we say, when the manufacturers were increasing the copay to something like six to seven hundred dollars per pen. Uh, we've not heard much about it. I know they went back just a little bit on them, but I'm not quite sure what's happening with them. That is one of the side effects that you have to watch. The Senra is another one you'll see it on TV. This is from the manufacturer designed to target and remove eosinophils. Remember, eosinophils are the white blood cells that uh, react in asthma. They tell us that you're having an asthma exacerbation. They also are increased with uh, parasitic infections too, and you're gonna see that with the next drug. It's an add-on maintenance treatment for patients age 12 and older who have this. It is clinically proven to improve lung function, lower oral steroid use by 75% for some folks, they come off the oral steroid, which is good, because remember, oral steroids are systemic, and we have a lot of reactions and side effects from systemic meds. It is not a rescue drug, and that's one thing that has to be told to those patients. Pixent is another one that's on the market. This is an injection. What's kind of interesting about this one, if you can prove to your physician that you can do these, these uh, injections without problems, the, con the clinician can go ahead and send this drug home with you in the pre-filled syringes, and you can take the medication at home. Uh, it's for moderate to severe asthma with eosinophilic phenotypes, patients 12 years and older. When they did some of the um, testing on this, they used 12 to age 87. Which is interesting. Uh, they don't know if it works on the parasitic infections. One of the things the website will tell you, if you have a parasitic infection prior to starting to fix it, you have to stop it or not start it until you've taken care of the infection. If you get one while you're on it and it's not being uh, cleared up, then the same thing, you have to go off the medication. It too is not a rescue drug. And this is one of the things that was interesting. This is just some of the testing that was done with this one. And you can see it was an experimental antibody and they tested on patients who had long acting asthma. And 52 who received the new medication had three asthma exacerbations compared to 23 among the 52 who received the placebo. And so that was quite st stunning if you think about it. And like I said, this was part of the clinical trials that got this drug on the market. So what's the side effect of this family? Because remember, oh, this family has a lot of side effects to it. Tremors is your number one. We see that. We're relaxing smooth muscles. Remember, smooth muscles are not only in your lungs, they're throughout your body also. You still see tachycardia, nausea, 
headache, palpations, palpitations, hypertension, restlessness I'm with these. So we have to watch our patients. Your patient is telling you, I don't want my treatment until after I eat. Um, you need to ask them what's going on. And a lot of times they'll tell you this, this is making me nauseous. So we can always adjust the schedule as long as they can breathe and they're not having any problems. Here's your upside, upside down, topsy-turvy world. It also causes fear, anxiety, tension, pallor, dizziness. We actually had a patient prior to us having to give her the treatments. Uh, she had to have Ativan, otherwise she couldn't take the treatments. So what are the, some of the contraindications and comments that go with this? It does contraindicated in hyperthyroidism, hypertension, because it causes hypertension. Tachycardia is another one because of the beta-1 effects. Not as great as they were with the earlier drugs, but they still exist with these drugs. Tolerance or tachyphylaxis, two of those may end up with, this drug, with these drugs. This is one of the reasons if you have asthma and you're treating patients, don't stand downwind of it, okay? Because you don't want to be inhaling all these drugs because it will infect, affect you. There are some synergistic effects that are poss possible, so we do have to watch that also. And there you see poor Jerry. He wasn't quite sure what was happening to him at this point.